I'd like to introduce the next panel, which is really talking about the changing face of Indian philanthropy. I think we're at a unique time in our lives where people, young and old, are looking at issues in India and realizing that it's as much their responsibility to help solve these problems as it is to make money. This next panel is going to include three speakers, very distinguished in their own rights and very experienced in philanthropy, yet all three have come from the business world. And the point of this discussion is really to understand from them what works, what doesn't, and why did they make the shift. So with that, I'd like to call the three panelists on stage and we can start the discussion. Thank you. To begin with, I'd like to ask Jayant, who spent the last 15 to 20 years abroad, recently moved back to India, one would assume that you've done this, Jayanth, because of how good America, or sorry, how good India is doing and how sort of weak sort of the West has been economically. But instead of joining the corporate sector, you've decided to join the Omidyar network. And I think if you could explain a little bit about the network and what sort of changed your views of both moving into India, back to India, I guess, and joining this sector, that would be fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, so much, Deval, for giving an opportunity to the Omidia Network uh, to share a little bit about our story. And, you know, you obviously asked me about my personal story as well. Uh, not much to say about my personal story. It's the story of a lot of folks of my generation who, uh, you know, were educated in India, went to the U.S., uh, did what they had to do professionally and have come back to India in one uh, fashion or the other to contribute back to, uh, to the country, its economic development and its social uh, uh, progress. So in that sense, uh, it's a story that uh, is actually becoming quite common in India and uh, uh, I'm just another, another participant, I guess, in the reverse uh, migration back uh, to, uh, to India. But I think the Omidya network story is, is a lot more interesting and in some ways, uh, as I give you just a brief uh, synopsis about Omidya network, you'll understand why somebody like me uh, with my background was drawn to it. Uh, I, I'm an engineer by training. I've spent 12 years in management consulting uh, and then worked at a hedge fund uh, for four years before I joined the Omidia Network. Uh, and the reason I joined the Omidia Network uh, is because of its unique approach to philanthropy. Uh, Omidia uh, actually uh, is, is, a, is a Farsi word. Uh, it's the, the last name, the surname for Pierre Omidia, who's the founder and chairperson of eBay. Uh, and in 2004, Pam and Pierre started Omidia Network with the view that uh, every person has the power to make a difference. Uh, and they wanted to create a philanthropy uh, which uh, would be able to help create opportunity for millions of people. And of course, Pierre in his own work at eBay had realized that if you can, uh, if you can create a platform that is technology enabled, uh, that can scale and be able to provide opportunity to everybody around the world that can have tremendous positive social impact. So it's not necessary that if you want to have positive social impact that you have to necessarily do it just through the non-profit sector. There are great for-profit companies, eBay is an example, but as is Twitter, or Google or Facebook, uh, any of these other companies as well that can also have tremendous positive social impact. So as he began to think about his philanthropy, he realized uh, that he should not necessarily restrict himself just to non-profit grant making, that it would make as much sense to do for-profit investing uh, as it would to do non-profit grant making. And which is why the name Omidia Network, it's not the Omidia Foundation, it's not the Omidia Fund, it's the Omidia Network. Uh, and the idea of the network is uh, twofold. One, uh, that we have both a for-profit LLC that actively seeks out great for-profit scalable companies that as they scale can have positive social impact, uh, as well as the uh, foundation uh, that can make grants uh, to non-profit organizations that are similarly scalable and sustainable and can have positive social impact uh, for, uh, on millions of people. So the notion of the network, of course, is that we have both a for-profit investment firm as well as a non-profit grant-making uh, philanthropy. And then the other aspect of the network is that even as we're going out and we are investing both in for-profit companies uh, and, uh, and in non-profit organizations, uh, the power of the network grows exponentially as you add, uh, obviously, more members to the network. And so the notion is that we are just another node uh, in, this, in this overall network. We are obviously enabling and are of service 
uh, to our organizations, but as we add more organizations that think in the same way that we do or share the same values and beliefs, which is around uh, opportunity creation and bottoms up thinking about problems on social development and economic development, uh, the, the network itself will strengthen and get better and stronger. So that's really the thinking around Omidyar Network. Um, and uh, having, as I said, many years uh, in, in the corporate sector, uh, both uh, consulting to and investing with technology companies, I was naturally drawn to this type of thinking around the power of the network uh, and the, 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 the positive feedback and the, and the sort of uh, virtuous cycle that you can create with the network effect. Uh, and so, f you know, when, when the Omidyar Network uh, uh, started calling around to see who might be interested in coming back to India uh, and working with the Omidyar Network in India, for me it was a very natural thing to do uh, because I was really drawn to the values, uh, the approach and the belief system that Pam and Pierre have uh, about how they want to serve humanity. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there's a wonderful article that Pierre has written, which I, I'm sure many of you have read, which came out in Harvard Business Review uh, not so long ago. If you all don't have a copy of it, be happy to, uh, to send you all a copy of it. But in that, uh, you know, he sort of talks about philanthropy as the love of humanity, which it is. That's what the word means, the love of humanity and the service to humanity. Uh, and uh, with the Omidya Network, I think we have, a, we have a very unique opportunity to be able to serve humanity and to serve wonderful organizations that are also uh, helping uh, people improve their lives. So in, in a nutshell, that's kind of Omidya Network and why I was drawn to it and, and why I'm here and why, you know, every day is, it's exciting and wonderful uh, to be here, to be with folks like yourself that are also here to, to serve humanity and for the love of humanity and, and to just work with such an inspiring group of people doing such wonderful work is, is just an incredible privilege and, and a blessing. Charlie Kleisner, um, born in Austria, living in California, a technology entrepreneur, a s technology serial entrepreneur, excuse me. What brought you to India? And what are some of the shifts you've had as a philanthropist in the past decade since you've been doing this full time, I believe? That's right. <clears throat> well, thank you, David. Uh, it's great to be here at the Indian Philanthropy Forum. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel. Let me just share a little bit uh, my story. Um, as it interrelates with India, philanthropy, and investing to set the stage for an interactive discussion and hopefully great uh, in, uh, dialogue as part of this panel and later today. So I immigrated to the US in 1986 and had a very, very successful career in Silicon Valley as a technology executive. And that career uh, enabled not only the shareholders of the companies that I was the CTO of or, or the senior technology executive of, uh, to become um, very wealthy, but also our family became wealthy through that. And so in the year 2000, 2001, my wife Lisa and I decided to create a family foundation to support social entrepreneurs worldwide, have a bigger positive impact. So as we started working uh, in this field, we actually rolled up our sleeves and started doing this full time and supported individual entrepreneurs all over the world, including India and Sri Lanka and Brazil and Africa. And by doing that and being an entrepreneur, uh, we challenged ourselves to figure out how can we actually scale this effort up by at least an order of magnitude to have a bigger impact in positive impact with our work. And that was the inspiration of uh, co-founding Social Impact International about seven years ago that also has as its goal to help capacity builders who help social entrepreneurs become more impactful. This will be a theme, I think, today and in India about how to enable intermediaries become more professional and more impactful. What better venue than this and DASRA leading this as it's in the sweet spot of this particular challenge and opportunity. So when we surveyed the opportunities to really help these capacity builders and social entrepreneurs worldwide, India became, it, it became clear that India was the hotbed of not only innovation and opportunities, but also challenges and opportunities to resolve them. So we did a, a study to evaluate where we should start working and India came out on the very, very, very top. So we moved and learned about India about seven years ago, six years ago, created an organization here, Social Impact India, 
but with the aim of actually looking for a capable local partner like DASRA, and we chose DASRA to be that, to help us implement our vision. I think India is uniquely positioned to make a, a big contribution to this, and this morning we will enable, uh, we will discuss that a lot more. Our foundation has made multiple grants and investments in India. Social Impact International is working in India and other regions of the world. When you look at the uh, challenge of actually enabling social entrepreneurs and social enterprises go to scale, uh, then it's also about the funders and the investment people. And so Lisa and I, on top of supporting social entrepreneurs worldwide, we are considered leaders in the field that uh, Omedia Network is in as well, and that's blended capital. Putting blended capital to use to have a bigger impact together, as opposed to only grants or only investments. We co-created a global network of impact investors in the last two years called Tonic, and it started out in North America, in the US and Mexico, moved to Europe very quickly, and now we are expanding to India. Again, India, I think, is ready to not only be the hotbed of innovation on the social entrepreneur side, but also the hotbed of innovation in putting blended capital, including grants, social capital, and commercial capital to work. Thank you, Charlie. Next is Aditi. Um, Aditi, you graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. You went to Harvard Business School, had a background in investment banking. When did you start thinking about philanthropy, and what are some of the shifts you've seen since you've been today? Um, I think I was exposed to philanthropy, you know, when I was, when I was very young. Uh, my family has been involved in many sort of charities, um, as they were called back then. And, uh, you know, I've always seen my grandfather, you know, giving and being involved in these. Uh, I think my father also instilled a culture of us always being generous and giving. Um, he, you know, he was very involved in his work, but uh, recently he started his own foundation called the Hemendra Kothari Foundation, um, which was uh, started only a few years ago when he um, sold part of his company. And, you know, he wanted to take time off now from work and just concentrate on that. So I was even exposed to it even more. But I realized at that point that, you know, one day I'm going to be responsible. Responsibility made me feel I need to dig deeper into this, do a little more research in here, and maybe have an opinion on these things. Uh, not to say that, you know, of course, all of us, I'm sure, want to do something bigger than ourselves at some point, and that, that was inside of me. But I think this was more of the catalyst. Um, and so I started getting more involved. Um, I met Dasra through a friend. I started asking questions. I attended one of Dasra's um, talks on education and giving. And I just got more inspired and realized that all these things, you know, have a framework. Uh, there is something, um, these things, it's more, you have to think of it more professionally. You have to think of it in more of a business-like format. Also, when I was in Harvard Business School, I did do a social enterprise class, which also exposed me to a lot of these issues. So all together, I think, um, you know, maybe it was fate. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Aditi. Jayant, you, you spoke quite a bit, and I think this is very unique about Omidyar Networks, even the name, is, is the realization that Omidyar is, will only be a catalyst and will, will sort of just bring individuals and groups together. And it's that network which grows on an annual basis that's really going to create the change and impact. A lot of the premise behind the Indian philanthropy forum was exactly that, um, realizing that you know, we can do one-day events, we can bring speakers and research together, but really it's the philanthropist, the network that we have in this room that's going to create impact. And, and I'd love if you can maybe give some examples of how the network has really potentially su superseded Omidyar <laughs> and really the scale and the leverage that you've seen and the multiplier effect, I think, by, by bringing communities together and individuals and how they've been able to interact beyond even the Omidyar. Yeah, thank you, Deval. I think you bring up a very interesting point, and it's also a very timely point because I'm just back late last night from Delhi where we had our annual event, uh, ON Heart, where we bring together all of our uh, portfolio organizations in India. We have 24 organizations in India 
uh, now and so uh, being with them and listening to their stories and seeing how they're beginning to collaborate and network and start working on opportunities together is extraordinarily exciting because while we have a global network and uh, the global network is, is flourishing and I can give examples of that, uh, to be able to see it in India as well take hold uh, is, is extraordinarily exciting. Uh, just, just to give you a feel for, for how the network is developing, uh, I, I'll illustrate it with one example which is uh, one of the, the major organizations that we've supported for many years is BRAC which is the world's largest NGO. Uh, and which operates in Bangladesh, uh, a fantastic, fantastic organization. Uh, if you all are familiar with BRAC, you'll know immediately uh, about what I'm saying in terms of their ability uh, to get a variety of different social services, whether it's microfinance, whether it's healthcare, whether it's legal services or education to Bangladesh's 60,000 villages. Uh, so it's, it's an NGO that's scaled up, that's international, uh, and is just having tremendous impact uh, in Bangladesh. In fact, a number of people believe that despite all of the challenges that Bangladesh has faced, the fact that its human development indicators are so much better than India is because of the fact that you have organizations like Grameen and BRAC operating in Bangladesh. So it is a very impressive organization, and it is an organization that's in our network. Uh, of course, it's a non-profit. Now, we have another organization in our network that's also quite well known, and in fact, I'm fortunate enough to serve on the board of this organization, which is D-Light, uh, which makes uh, the world's best and most affordable solar lanterns. Uh, just an incredible, wonderful product. I don't know if you all have seen it, but it's like the iPhone of solar lanterns in terms of its design. But just to illustrate to you the power of the network and, and, and the way these linkages and partnerships are beginning to be forged now, uh, D-Light has been in discussions with BRAC to be able to use BRAC's fantastic distribution and its ability to get to Bangladesh's 60,000 villages sell its solar lanterns uh, through them. And as I was uh, at Owen Hart, uh, the D-Light folks were telling me that they've now got their first order from BRAC to be able to distribute these solar lanterns and that program is rapidly scaling up. So this is an example of how the network is working, the collaboration is happening and one organization in our network is working with another organization in a very sort of organic and uh, an entrepreneurial way and, and the network is, is really being able to provide more and more products and services uh, to people who are in need of those. And this also illustrates a very fundamental principle by which we operate, which is, you know, in the past as people have thought about philanthropy or, philanthropy, or they've thought about problems of economic development, uh, which philanthropy of course is, is deeply engaged in, you know, the notion in some way, the notion in some way has been tops down. And they will, not to put you on the spot on this, for instance, you said, you know, we've got to fix malnutrition in India. And that's one way of thinking about it. It's like saying there's a problem. There's a problem with HIV AIDS in India, or there's a problem with malnutrition in India, or there's a problem uh, with sanitation in India. Let's work on it and let's, let's try and solve it from a tops down perspective. But, and to your great credit, what you also do is you look for those bottoms up entrepreneurial organizations that are working in that sector. And because they have a sustainable model, whether it's a for-profit business model or a non-profit earned income or donor-based model, these bottoms-up models, as they scale, they start to solve these problems. And I think what we've learned empirically about what's worked in, huma you know, in, human, in, in, in humanity in terms of business or, uh, or any political movement, unless, unless it's bottoms-up, unless it's virtually leaderless, many of these movements, many of these revolutions, many of these changes don't happen and they don't stick. And that's a very important part of what we do. And that is why the notion of a network is so important to us, which is it's bottoms up, it's organic, and ultimately at the end of it, 